son, I just want you to get some experience with your best friends here. Spend some time. And they talk about his departure. They talk about his death. And Moses is like, well, let me tell you about death, Jesus, because see, Moses has died. He's experienced death once before. And so he can tell Jesus about that. And, and Elijah hasn't. Elijah was miraculously taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And, and Elijah's like, dude, Jesus, you know, go through this process because when you ascend to heaven a few days, weeks after that, it's going to be so cool. You know, the clouds and all that stuff, it's just going to be awesome. You've never experienced anything like it because these guys have experienced things that Jesus, the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, has never experienced because they've walked through this earthy stuff that Jesus is now walking through, and they can provide him encouragement. That's what the father does for his son, because he loves his son so much, he wants him to be motivated, he wants him to have the momentum to carry it through, and look what happens. Flip over to verse 51. After Jesus comes down off of the mountain, there's this situation where Jesus casts out a demon and there's some debate over who's the greatest disciple and Jesus doesn't care about that. But verse 51, look at that. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. I've talked about this before. The word resolutely there in the Greek is literally this. He faced his face. He faced his face towards Jerusalem, which means he turned and he fixed it. He locked his face on Jerusalem. He put blinders on the sides of his eyes. And he was going to Jerusalem and no one was going to distract him. No one was going to get in his way because he knew who he was. He was the loved son of the Father in heaven. And he knew his mission. His mission was to go to Jerusalem. His mission was to depart this physical earth in death, then to rise again, and then to ascend into heaven. He knew his mission, which was to seek and to save the lost people of this world. And nothing was going to get in his way. He fixed his face. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And the intensity of that decision is the momentum builder that carried him all the way through the terror of the cross. There was someone else on that mountain, though. You saw him just a little bit. His name was Peter. And his experience on the mountain isn't exactly the same as Jesus' experience on the mountain. Peter's... Peter's a guy that we like. A lot of us can relate to Peter because Peter seems fickle, you know? He's always sticking his foot in his mouth. He's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. He's always making a mistake. He's always being impulsive and passionate and, and getting himself involved in things that he just, you know, maybe shouldn't go there, stuff like that. And so we relate to Peter because he's one of these spiritual heroes, so we think, who's got these ups and these downs and these ups and these downs. And we're like, I have these ups and these downs. And so I can relate to Peter. But what we don't realize is there's only one thing that's going on in Peter's life all the way through this thread of the gospel story. The time when Jesus is on the earth, what Peter is dealing with there, there's one thread that runs all the way through it, and I'm going to give it a word here. And the word is defiance. Everything Peter does comes from a heart of defiance. So here's Jesus. He's talking with Moses and Elijah about when he's departing the earth. And Peter steps forward. And he says, wait a minute, master. I have an idea. If I were to build you some shelters here, you wouldn't have to go anywhere. See, that's what he's saying. The, the Greek word there that translates shelters is the same Greek word that could be translated shrine. Where Peter is saying, hey, listen, we've got the holiest men in the universe right here on this mountain right now. Let's do something about it. You know, Jesus, if we charge admission, we could, get, we could take care of this mission of yours for, for forever. We wouldn't have to worry about it. We'd just you know, say, okay, there's Moses, and he's five bucks. And there's Elijah, and he's 10 bucks. And then there's Jesus, and he's 15. So you know, come on up here. We've got these little shrines. Peter's like, let's institutionalize this so you don't have to leave. It's direct defiance. That's why the voice from heaven speaks out and says, this is my son. Listen to him. If he talks about departure, you let him depart. If Jesus says something, you let it go. You let him do what he's going to do. See, we like Peter because we can kind of relate, but 
his defiance is actually a good thing sometimes. You know, Peter is the guy that walks on the water to Jesus. Remember that story? He's in the boat. Jesus is walking on the water on Lake Galilee, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and, and there's this storm and stuff. And Peter looks out there and he sees Jesus. And, and Peter defies conventional wisdom that, you know, when you get out of a boat, you don't keep walking. You know, he, he defies that. He says, scientific reasoning is out my window. I don't care about momentum and force and acceleration and, and water and whatnot. I'm just going to, Jesus is out there. If Jesus is there, I can defy science and I can go where he is. I can do that kind of stuff. Later on, Peter will stand in front of the Sanhedrin after Jesus has ascended to heaven. And Peter is now convinced that Jesus really is everything he said he was going to be. Peter is now convinced that Jesus is the savior of mankind. After that time, way off into the future, just a a couple years later, Peter now is standing in front of the court of the elders of Israel, the Sanhedrin, the religious council, and he says to them, judge for yourself, judge for yourself whether or not I should obey you or I should obey God. See, Peter's defiance sometimes comes in handy. Even, I don't know if you know this story, but the day Jesus was raised from the dead on Easter Sunday, Peter and John both run to the tomb. John gets there first. And Peter defies Jewish custom and goes into the tomb. A Jewish person wasn't supposed to be near a dead body. That's not what happened. I mean, am I doing something wrong up here? Is that going to work? Okay, we'll see. We'll see if it works. Anyway, so Peter just defies Jewish custom and he goes right into the tomb. Maybe he knew that Jesus wasn't there, and so there's not going to be a dead body there, so therefore it's okay for him to go there. I don't know, but he's still defiant. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to take you to two experiences in, G in Peter's life where I believe God is trying to give him a moment of decision that will, be, that will build some momentum in his life in a, in a positive direction. And take a look at these two experiences. We could look right here in Luke chapter 9, because it happens. It happens right here in Luke chapter 9, but it's more detailed if we go back to Matthew 16. So head on over to Matthew 16 with me, and we'll read it over there. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 25. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And we'll come and we'll do verses 24 and 25 in just a little bit. Okay, so, so what's happening here is that there's two stories that are completely paralleled with each other. And to make it really clear, I've got a chart that's on the screen here, and I want you to see it and, and copy it down. So here we go. Here's the first piece of the chart, if you could bring it up. On the first encounter, Jesus says, tell me who I am. And Peter says, the world says you're John the Baptist, or you're some prophet, or you're some other good guy. The world says you're a good teacher. And Peter defies the world, and he says, but I think you're the Christ. And there's Peter's defiant attitude that's coming out in a positive way. And he's defying the world around him and he's embracing Christ. You're the Christ. And then look at the rest of what happens. Jesus then says to him, you are Peter. And then he says, and this is going to be the foundation rock for everything I'm doing on the earth. 
And then he says, you've heard God, not men. But if you go to the next account, Jesus then says, he's starting to talk about how he's going to die. He's going to be, he's going to be crucified. And Peter takes him aside and he says, no, that's not going to happen. Look what happens there. He's defying Christ now and he's embracing his own ideas of how the world should work. You know how Peter's thinking. He's thinking, man, I just got this question right. It's time for me to get this next question right. Jesus is just testing me. He's not really going to die. I've got this idea. I'm going to step up. But look what Jesus says. It's not your Peter. Now he says you're Satan. And it's not a foundation rock for Jesus' mission. It's a stumbling stone that Jesus says to him. And it's not that he's heard God. He's actually only hearing men, not God. It's exactly flipped. But the thing that I want to draw your attention to most profoundly is that when Peter fully embraces Jesus, he becomes more of himself. When Peter rejects Jesus, he loses his identity. Whatever Peter is, whatever he's supposed to do, whatever he's about, he loses it. Jesus can look him in the eye and he can say, you're Satan. You're a stumbling stone. You're hearing men, not God. Everything Peter was supposed to be and to do is lost from that one decision where he says, I'm going to oppose Jesus. Uh, there's some blanks here I've got for you to fill in. Just go ahead and write this down. See, there are two kinds, two kinds of things going on here. There's the prideful defiance that Peter's expressing. And what we recognize from that is that prideful defiance dissolves you. It takes who you are as a person and it dissolves it away. But surrender to Christ develops you. Surrender to Christ lets you become everything that God designed you and intended you to be. We live in a world that thinks it's, it's the exact opposite. In our world today, we believe this. I don't know if you believe it, but the society around us believes it. We believe that I need to stand up for myself to be myself. I need to defend myself to be myself. I need to assert myself to be myself. If the world opposes me, I defy them back. And I defy the world in favor of me or else I'll lose me. That's what we feel. That's why you get so angry when someone does something stupid on the road with their car. Because they're somehow getting in front of you, which means they're defying you. They're saying, listen, I don't care about the fact that you're in that lane and the entire lane should belong to you. I'm going to get in this lane too. And you're like, whoa there. I don't want, you're defying me. You're defying my 